Hello, I'm Carla Lauder and I am the editor of SPAR3D.com. I'm here at the Year of Infrastructure 2019 and I'm joined by Greg Bentley and Keith Bentley and we're going to talk a little bit about digital twins and iTwins today. How do you think that the ideas and the capability of digital twins has evolved over time? Well, the capabilities that make a digital twin possible, you know, I think of them as, as requiring sort of three characteristics. The digital context is one, we're going to come back to that, and the significance of what SPAR 3D covers. But the digital twin needs to be explanatory, it needs to have veracity. We say digital components, you could say the work of infrastructure engineers. It's been dark in the past, but if we can open it up and have that data be useful throughout the life cycle, uh, then that's the second characteristic. Over that life cycle, of course, it's digital, but it's only a twin if it's synchronized to the changes that occur in an infrastructure project and asset. That's where the technologies Keith's helped to uh, uh, guide us to at Bentley Systems with the distributed hub and I models and so forth are, are key. But let me go back to it has to be reality. Reality is 3D. Well, I like to say reality over time is 4D. I'm not trying to rename SPAR <laughs> to be SPAR 4D. We can 4D, be SPAR 4D. We've talked about it. But when you talk about those technologies evolving, of course, our context capture was new a few years ago. That's where we create the reality mesh and overlapping photographs. And SPAR 3D, of course, you've been covering laser scanning from the beginning. That's now a hybrid part of the process where you need and can benefit from, from uh, laser scans. But again, not to result in a point cloud, but an engineering ready digital mesh that is the twin to which the, uh, the digital components uh, can be embedded in their context and so forth. But the acquisition we announced here of Orbit GT mm -hmm. to bring in and facilitate mobile mapping where, you know, I like to say surveying can be continuous. So I use the term 4D surveying to mean it can be done often with mobile mapping on vehicle mounted uh, uh, LIDAR and cameras and so forth. That really completes the circle, could I say? Yeah. So evolving for digital twins to have that digital context. And now we, as I say, have technologies also that are software technologies for the digital components and the digital chronology. And uh, you mentioned a minute ago some dark data. What do you mean by dark data? Well, everything involved in infrastructure engineering is created with intelligent applications now. Engineers use our open modeling applications, our open simulation applications or those of others, but the result is work deliverable, if you, if you like, that are in obscure uh, technical files that are inscrutable to analytics or, or visibility for that matter, unless you have the software that creates it. So we've, we've gotten in the habit of assuming that engineering, that, that information, that engineering information isn't part of what we do with AI and, and machine learning and analytics generally. So we say, opening up that dark data, if it can describe itself, we can semantically align it, we can uh, manage it, we can, uh, we can make it relevant and useful over time, including mm -hmm. analytics that look at things over 4D and so forth, our reason for saying 4D digital twin. So the much discussed McKinsey report in construction about the inefficiencies therein, uh, you know, it was eye-opening for many about, you know, kind of the scope of that inefficiency and kind of where um, construction is lagging behind other industries. So how do you envision that going digital and digital twins will really help to address that problem? Well, it can really help to address that problem. And, and we look at, you know, they say there's a lot of uh, technology investment going into construction. An awful lot of it is just about automating the 2D workflows that exist today and, and creating, uh, you know, uh, paper on screens and tablets and so forth. That's not fundamental. Fundamentally, construction is a 4D process. It's about the occupancy of space and time and logistics and industrializing processes with modules and so forth. That's where the advancement will come in. Nothing less than a digital twin can, is needed to automate those things and, and, and make them uh, uh, work well. Now, constructor, constructors know they need that, they want that, but a gap is there on the process and people side, and that's the reason that we and TopCon have formed a joint venture we've announced here called Digital Construction Works to provide services for 
digital integration, if you like, they're a digital accelerator and are putting themselves at the service of constructors and concessions and joint ventures and so forth on, on major projects to help bring together the uh, technologies of hardware and positioning, the, tech, the cloud services that can make a digital ten, twin be uh, uh, persisted across the uh, ecosystem of the, of the construction project and across the project digital twin so that we can focus on people and process changes and invent new workflows that will demand and, and require the construction digital twins. I'm hopeful. Um, so yeah. what do you see kind of uh, beyond that as the construction industry's next steps? Like what, what is the, where, where is the going digital? Where are we at in the process of going digital? What needs to come next? Well, uh, sometimes you will hear that someday there'll be robotics, you know, to the extent of automation, even robotics on construction sites. And you see the odd example of that and so forth. The thing is, with something we call constructioneering, where you consider the engineering aspect of construction and engineering itself is construction driven, you can wind up, for instance, in a heavy civil site. The first autonomous vehicles on the roadway are the machine controlled graders, but they, with a digital twin and a cloud service, they can be providing the as operated conditions and then routinely resurveyed and so forth. In other words, we, we should think in no lesser terms than automating things to that level of robotics. It's already doable. We just need to increase the ambition. We appreciate uh, SPAR uh, helping with that. You know, I've, I've always thought of um, SPAR's constituencies and opportunities sort of, you could say 3D, but I like to say existing conditions and conditions capture, and that can be over a life cycle that includes uh, operations and maintenance of infrastructure, not only capital projects. And the importance of the construction stage is the work of the engineers in design is going to be lost if the 3D model and construction starts from scratch. Because that's how we do construction these days in the 3D model. But if you don't start with the BIM model and advance it to a digital twin, then the intelligent work of the engineers can never be the digital DNA and operations that it can be with a digital twin approach. And you're right, therefore it is necessary to increase the ambition on the construction side. But the fact that construction is fundamentally a 4D exercise gives me hope that when we focus on that, the 4D aspect of it, we'll, we'll make that A lot of sense. So I want to turn to you, Keith, to talk about some of the back end and how this is being accomplished. You know, okay. uh, so for those who are not familiar, can you talk about what an iModel's role is in relation to a digital twin and kind of how that's managed? Right, so Greg mentioned that a lot of the information during the process of designing uh, turns out not to get used for, for anything other than its original purpose. And therefore, we, we refer to that as dark. It's not that it's more valuable, it's just not used. The idea of a I model is if we can take that information and transform it in, in certain regards so that it can be understood later on, to hold that data and put it in a form with, that is accessible uh, and is it's trusted used for many other purposes. So iModel's role is to be that container to, to bring the information that previously was only accessed through specific tools and make it generally accessible. Yeah, and I think you know having the right people have access to the right information is very key. Yeah, and only if the data can be trusted. Right, right. 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 It's a good information. The, the, That's the one of the points we're realizing here is once your data is no longer dark, you can see its quality. <laughs> and, and maybe, and maybe, maybe it's not as good as so, right. so improving the quality is also something machine learning can help with and so forth. We sort of showed that with our asset-wise iTwin services, the open utilities example in, in that case. Um, and what was behind the decision to make like iMetalJS open source? Who benefits from that? Well, so the concept of a digital twin was not conceived by Bentley. It's not our, our idea, but uh, the concept is generally recognized hugely valuable. Nobody debates whether or not a digital twin is a good idea. So it's how to make a digital twin. And when, when we talk to people about what they would wish for in their digital twin, what we discover is everybody wants something different. And always there is requirements to connect a digital twin to other information systems. So who's going to be the vendor for the digital twin? Well, I don't think there's going to be one vendor for a digital twin. So what, what's sort of necessary is there be a platform upon which we can build interoperable tools that will connect 
information that belongs visible through the digital twin to the, the use the consumer. So we said, look, we're going to have to write a lot of that stuff as back to systems. Uh, we have a pretty good uh, idea of how we would like for it to work, but obviously, uh, for it to be a platform, it has to be something that would work more broadly than that. So the idea of open source is uh, invalidated. We use a lot of, we consume a lot of open source stuff. We see a lot of value by being able to make contributions to the open source projects. So we said, let's do do that with our stuff. And so the I model, the technology that you use to access an I model, to visualize an I model, to create information, synchronize data with an I model, all of the source that we wrote to do that is now on GitHub. Anybody anywhere can use it. You can download it and modify it. You can fork it if you'd like. We kind of expect that people will start with what we have and use it for other purposes than the banking system. So, you know, the concern uh, about open sourcing things is, well, are we going to give our technology to our competitors? And yes, I think it's possible and probable that some people will use the open, our open source technology to compete with banking systems, but by and large, we just think that the industry needs a, a digital twin. The only way it's going to happen is if a lot of people agree on sort of the basic premise of the digital twin, and right. we have offered we've done as a starting point for that. You know, how does um, the iModel.js kind of connect people in various roles across a project? Right, so, you know, the, the basic premise of a digital twin is it must be accessible anywhere by anybody, right? So we accept that as, you know, why it would be a digital twin versus simply just a information system disconnected. You have to say, well, we need to be able to make it so that it can run anywhere, right? So that it can be uh, used by Types of uh, systems running on personal computers, on mobile devices, uh, and so what we've tried to do is make it so that you can use iModel JS and you can customize it so that it connects with systems created by uh, other backend, other data sources, and the user experience looks like a seamless uh, single uh, view of uh, a digital twin, but a digital twin really would be a collection of data sources. And those who haven't worked with digital twins before, what's the learning curve like? Well, uh, one of the one of the biggest learning curves ha just has to do with you know, embracing the concept of a distributed world. You know, information isn't stored where it's contained in a, in a, in a box, in a file on a single disk. So those people who are used to writing software and, and interacting with systems where you, know, you have a local copy of something and then it's disconnected connected world takes a different approach, a different mindset for learning, but it isn't unique to the infrastructure, right? So we're not unique to family systems. So what we're discovering is we're, a lot of the people that see our, our source code and, and use the tools that we've created find it very natural because it's very similar to, to other uh, systems that they would have used. Yeah, so it's more of a mindset So we're, we're hoping to minimize a, a, that <laughs> learning curve. Right. It's not uh, and, trivial. But. And Carla, you're asking about a learning curve from a technical side to work with the open source environment yes. and yeah. so forth, to work with digital twins when they are a cloud service that is available with immersive visualization is the most intuitive thing there is. Right. It's much more so intuitive and, and I like to say it's going to solve the data quality problem because when you can actually find in engineering information because you can navigate intuitively and immersively like with the HoloLens 2 here and so forth and other immersive technologies of which that's just the beginning, then it'll be used and it'll be kept up to date. Uh, it really is a terrific opportunity for 3D and 4D where deliverables, if you go back to surveying, I think surveying has a, a tremendous but different future because surveying won't be done for a particular purpose rarely with specialized deliverables. It will be done continuously or I'd like to even pose the challenge, can it be 4D, can there be 4D surveying? The mobile mapping is an example. It's so easy right. to remap a city by driving it, or the uh, vehicle mounted units will be on uh, autonomous vehicles. Of course, they're already capturing that data, or on the trains and metros and so forth. And then the, the learning curve to use that information uh, when it's in the form of a digital twin that is a reality mesh. 3D, we actually experience. That's why it's a twin. 
there's no learning curve at all for that. We think it's going to increase the demand for, for that information, again, securely at the right time in the right place. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you both, uh, Keith and Greg, for taking the time to talk to SPAR 3D today, and we're looking forward to following everything that's going on in the future. Thank SPAR 4D. 4D. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Sure. See ya.